to talk a little bit about the second book of Liszt's Année de Perinage, uh, which is subtitled Deuxième Année Italie, and which has been always a very popular set of pieces and that falls really into three distinct sections. There are two very serious pieces at the beginning, and then they are leavened by a very light-hearted piece, and then there are the three Petrarch sonnets, and then there is the enormous piece, Fantasia Quasi Sonata, uh, the so-called Dante Sonata, uh, at the end. The first piece is called Sposalizio, and the title means betrothal, and it is taken from the title of Raphael's uh, picture of that name, and it depicts the uh, engagement, if you like, between the Virgin Mary and St. Joseph. This opening phrase... It's very interesting because Liszt only ever uses it uh, when it's got something to do with, the, with its su succession of falling fifths, something to do with um, marriages. And the, the most obvious piece that I can think of is Epithalam, which is either for violin and piano or for piano solo, which is... Um, in a similar key and has a similar shape of moving notes. But in any case, he's trying to find this, something which is a, a good melodic shape, which then later serves to be very good accompaniment material because there are several thematic fragments in this piece. The next thing that happens after this one becomes the basis for the second tune, which is... It's interesting that this, which then of course has this and the falling fifth in the answering phrase, didn't start life that way. If, if you have the chance to look at the manuscript of the first version of this piece, there are just silences between the phrases, and it goes... So it was really a very, very happy decision that he made to put the answering phrase in, and then it looks like two people uh, who are going to make promises to each other, talking to each other. In between this, he sets up some marvellous harmonic alterations before you come back to the E major, which is, as in many of his pieces, it's one of his favourite keys for religious subjects. He uses a little bit of shorthand in the left hand, uh, in bar 13 and 14 are written like this. The next bar, the left hand is written as arpeggiation. And two bars later. But we have enough information to know that he's really wanting the same rhythm that he had in the two previous bars preserved. So... Which is not difficult to do, and it saves having any kind of bump. Um, by trying to arpeggiate too quickly. The next piece of melodic information in this piece 
which he's going to mix together with the opening theme very soon, is this one. And you notice at that point, the middle voice is adapting what we had in the opening bar with these pair of, at this time, falling fourths. And then, then in the next bar, but one. And then two bars again, later again. And that's going to become once we get to putting the two tunes together. This actual melody here we know exactly what he was intending to convey with that because there's a later setting of this particular melody in a piece for voices and organ or voices and piano duet called Zur Traung which is simply the same as Sposalizia and uh, at which the words that are sung over the top of this are simply Ave Maria, and it's just Ave Maria repeated many times, no other words at all. Once we get that tune and the accompaniment together, We have all of the musical material of the work, and this become it, it gets itself to a very passionate climax. And just by some kind of piece of musical foresight, he writes at the end this. Which, as many commentators have observed, is essentially identical to the opening of Debussy's first arabesque, which came many, many years later. The only other thing that's important is for people who don't have hands that will take a tenth. And Liszt very often writes tenths, though he very often also writes an arpeggio sign on them so that it's quite possible to negotiate them. But what goes wrong very often in performances is that people play the lower note of the arpeggio before the beat, then change the pedal on the beat, and either lose the bass note, or they've managed to include harmony from the previous chord because they didn't want to lose the bass note. But it can be solved very quickly by always playing the bottom note together with all of the other material, as in... and then adding the top note afterwards. If you go which is, I don't mean to play as ugly as that, but that's going to leave this one before the beat, which it probably means it's still going to be have this. And if you do it wrongly, you have something in there that shouldn't be there. But if you play it on the beat, And this doesn't just work for Liszt, it works for almost every composer where there are wide stretches. It's going to become very important a bit later on in the book when we get to the uh, Petrarch Sonnet 104, which starts with a whole bunch of tenths in the left hand, which if your hand is big enough, there's no problem, but if it isn't, you have to come up with a solution. We shall come to that before we're much older. The second piece in this cycle is Il Penseroso, which is a, the title of a sculpture by Michelangelo, 
and the sculpture and indeed the piece in the first edition has a four-line poem by Michelangelo written on it and Liszt actually wanted it to be printed at the head of the music and in many editions it's either missing, as in this one, or is, is present but only in the appendix or in the critical notes, which is a part of the book which I am sorry to report that most piano players never look at, but I think you should. There's always stuff to... They, they, they are trying to give you bits of information. So, but essentially, this poem is... Well, it's, it's ironical, but it says, I'm grateful for sleep and even more for being made of rock. And while, while, while uh, um, harm and shame endure, being unable to see or to hear, for me, is a great adventure. But don't make me go there. Speak softly. And <clears throat> let's put this at the beginning. And so it, it's a serious piece. It's also a, a very simple musical thought. And there's this remarkable uh, chordal progression with suspensions over the top of it <clears throat> that comes twice just towards the end of the piece. And this piece is marked lento, and it has one of the traditional characteristic rhythms of a funeral march. So there's no problem in coming up with the right speed for this. It's got to be something like... faster than that because when this theme comes the second time it has got a very heavy tread in quavers in the left hand which is a really remarkable passage And we have to risk his pedaling, which is quite heavy, but he wants, he's already written Pesante on it, so I was sorry to. We can rattle our pedal a little bit towards the end of that, but essentially he does want both of those notes to ring at the same time. Anyone who's interested in looking at further works of Liszt will be pleased to know that this piece is also the basis of another much longer work called La Notte, which exists for piano solo, for piano duet, for violin and piano, and also for orchestra, and uh, in which he uses this piece twice, one time slightly varied from the other, and with a completely new middle section, and it becomes a much longer work, and it's essentially the second of his three funeral odes. After the darkness of this piece, it's a real pleasure to come across the third piece in the book. And the th this is a piece which is very often used as a little encore because it's, it's so dainty and gentle. It also raises the whole question of the difference between uh, original music and transcription. And Liszt was quite happy to put in into this cycle of original pieces this piece which is essentially a transcription of a vocal piece by Bononcini uh, which I'm not even sure that Liszt knew that it was because the fact that he calls it Canzonetta del Salvatore Rosa might be presumed to think that that Salvatore Rosa who as we all know was a painter and a poet uh, whether he 
actually also wrote the tune, but he didn't. It's definitely by Bononcini. The uh, most curious thing about it is that the cantata by Bononcini in which this tune is printed um, didn't actually get published until after Liszt's death, so it's a mystery as to how he came by it. But it's an excellent tune, however he came by it, and um, the poem is worth looking at as well. And as very often with Liszt, when, it, when there's a, a, a long poem, he writes the words above the notes so that you will use them as a source of inspiration in your performance. But um, it's essentially a, a, a poem about a philanderer. Uh, he, he speaks of always going from one place to another and, every, and, and, and always changing, but what doesn't change is his desires and his, the, the fire of his passion. So this is a very jolly and pleasant work. And uh, it's interesting also to know that in the earlier draft of this piece, Liszt, for some witty reason, calls it Canzonetta per il clavicembolo, as if this piece is playable on a harpsichord, which it certainly is not. But it is rather a fun piece to play, and it's very light-hearted, and it's just what you need before you plunge into the passion of the three Petrarch sonnets. <laughs> 